But uh, in any case, I've had two cups of coffee and I'm ready to rock and feeling good. The subject matter today is not just about REC's newest, most exciting product, which we've called the NPEAK, um, but also a fundamental discussion of solar panel technologies that are on the market today. What does it mean for, for me as an installer? What does it mean for the end customer? And in a little bit, this it won't be a science lesson, but a little bit about the physics behind how these things are made uh, and, and what it matters. Because it's become very clear to us that there is certainly a fixation on what these things look like aesthetically. And then also simply the STC uh, power class. Um, in real life, there's uh, a lot more to it and a lot more elements that do constitute value. So without further ado, we'll jump right into it. My general style here will be conversational, I would say, meaning that I am not going to read every single word on the screen. Please utilize your computers for that. Um, any questions come up, of course, use that uh, chat functionality and we'll have a nice discussion at the end on that. Um, but really, my thrust will be to contextualize what this all means. And as much as possible, I will try to use layman's terms, layman's concepts. As an industry, we love to use acronyms. We love to get uh, fairly complicated about things. And ultimately, we all need to, especially in the residential segment, be able to distill this something to something that is a compelling and strong, simple value proposition that a homeowner can understand and, and really buy into and want to be a part of. So that is the goal here. Um, the background is that REC is in the most transformational period of its company life, which has been a bit over 20 years, known as a multi-crystalline uh, pioneer with advancements such as uh, really the first to deploy multi-perk, half cut cells, et cetera. Also with a tremendous amount of experience up the entire value chain, all the way from the source silicon to the, the solar panel itself. Um, but we are in the midst of a change. The industry is in the midst of a change. It's gonna result in, in better, more cost efficient products than we've ever seen before. So really excited to talk about not just where we're at today, uh, but where we're going. I'm glad you all can be a part of that. The specific product itself that you can uh, can purchase today through AEE is the NPEAK series. There is going to be a difference with respect to the power class by the proportion of year that we're talking about. The current version of this product, um, and we'll expound a little bit into the history of it, what it is, but I know uh, the elements that folks will be most interested in is what are the basic properties of the product I can buy today it is the product that you see depicted on your screen. It is predominantly a 320 watt class on a white back sheet in the first half of the year. There are some advancements that will go into the cell design that will bump that up to a 330 in the second half of the year. type mono perk versus n type even at a similar power density, a similar power rating, what are the differences and why should I care? But specifically, this product, this is N-Type Mono from REC. This is an REC cell design. A fundamental property of N-Type Mono is it does not suffer from any sort of light-induced degradation. We have also migrated to a newer frame design, which is a 30 millimeter thickness, but adding in support bars. What this does is preserve a great deal of strength, um, especially at specific mounting points. Um, I'll elaborate on that a little bit further because I know some folks want to use railless racking that grabs the module in a slightly different place. We have a nice color-coded diagram to talk about what is, is workable and what is not a great idea. But basically utilizing the strongest parts of the module, we can get a very high, almost 150 pound per square foot snow load. There's some alternate racking methodologies where we can get also a very, very high wind load uh, relevant to people in hurricane zones. There is a new warranty released by REC of this year, um, which you will see on your screen as a 20 to 25 year product warranty. What does that mean? It means the off the shelf product, this is the workmanship warranty, uh, 20 years, but the ability to register for an REC installer program, receive some training and also uh, be able to receive further benefits that we are developing as we go. We have a full-time marketing manager now hired who's working on this program. So whether we're talking about simply accessing uh, co-op marketing funds, other sorts of traditional things, we're really looking to enhance the value package in addition to what AE already provides you um, from, from REC. So part of that will be signing up for that. You will get a bump from the 20 to a 25 year 
uh, product warranty, that's the workmanship side. Again, the other side of the warranty is the power production. We're gonna see a 0.5% annual degradation rate, which is very strong. Part of that is because of the strength of this module design. Even though it has a thinner frame with the support bars, you have much less flexing through time of the laminate. Um, and that really preserves the long-term reliability and durability of the module. On a linear warranty, you extrapolate that all the way out to the end. It means at least 86% of what it did in year one is what it would be doing in year 25. Pretty darn strong. Moving on from that, this is the background of what this particular product is and also the essential foundation for where REC is going. I mentioned this is a big transformational year. Our particular product assortment, our offering, our market position will change quite a bit this year versus what you've seen in the last few years. And next year will change even more than that. Very excited to talk about this. Where it started as a uh, prudent and careful manufacturing company. Keep in mind, REC's reputation has been developed through years and years of hard work. And also the most important internal metric, I've been in this organization eight and a half years, most important internal metric for REC is not hitting the highest possible power numbers. It's not the highest uh, gross or net margin. It is literally the warranty claims rate. As a manufacturing company, we take great pride in having a warranty claims rate that's approximately 50 to 60 parts per million. Literally, we have to express this parts per million because if it's a percentage, you're talking about 0 0.00006. So that's an order of magnitude less um, than, than reputable competitors. Um, it's also an interesting aside that just because you pay a lot for a product um, doesn't imply uh, necessarily that there's quality. So I found this out firsthand with an experience with a, uh, a Tesla electric vehicle, which I no longer have. Um, I know there's also been concerns around a uh, very high efficiency uh, back contacted type of architecture that was uh, produced by a American manufacturer that has some French ownership and produces in the Philippines. Again, a very expensive product that's had some pretty extreme warranty issues. Or you see, completely embraces the fact that customers need this product to work reliably and produce a high degree of energy for decades and decades out in the field. That's the number one priority for REC, and you will not see REC take risks around that, in essence, brand promise to all of our customers. So how this relates to our foray into a new technology, keep in mind we had over 20 years of experience in multi, going towards a mono future means we are picking up new and additional skill sets. A lot of what we learned before is applicable, but we are edging into this in a way where we can still feel very comfortable about the product performance and product reliability. So the way this is starting is literally with one, what we call pilot line. This is a one single cell line that we built in Singapore at our factory last year. That's the picture that's on the screen. It started up in about the middle of last year, only an annual capacity of about 150 megawatts we spent a bit over $40 million to do that, um, but that was just the tip of the iceberg. Where we will be at the end of this year is approximately 750 megawatts of ultra high efficiency product. And this is what we're gonna be talking about for the remainder of these few slides here. This is a little window into the actual cell manufacturing as I had alluded to before. Typically with a new product, there will be an initial offering and then there's uh, some level of de-bottlenecking where you're increasing your units per hour of production, you're making little changes to improve the power characteristics of the product. So where we see this being at 320 in the first half of the year, going to 330 in the second half, and further architectures, this is a bit of a teaser, will even go beyond that. This next slide with these four icons at the bottom, this is really intended to be a depiction of what we are leveraging from the past that we know to work well, and what are we adding that is new that can work even better? We were the first to deploy in large commercial volumes the uh, half cut cell architecture, the basic premise there being twofold, which is one to uh, improve module energy yield um, and, and power density by reducing resistive losses. This is basically a way to overcome what's called cell to module loss. The current of a cell is determined by the area of the cell and the resistance increases as a square to that value. So if we simply cut our cells in half, we have basically half the current, we have lower resistive losses to get back into normal voltage and current parameters so you don't end up with strange string sizes. 
we are running two halves of the module electrically in parallel as opposed to the whole thing in series. What this also means is that we get some interesting partial shaded benefits. These have been talked about before, been a part of the REC Twin Peaks series since 2014. We are preserving that with the new model. Works extremely well. Folks thought that REC was crazy in 2014, um, but now others, of course, have jumped on board to the point where some of these products are almost direct clones of what REC is doing. We'll look at that in just a couple slides. The actual cell design is a N-type mono wafer. So negatively doped, we'll talk about what that means and why it matters in the field. But the specific architecture here is, I'd say, on the lower end of the exotic spectrum that is possible with N-type mono. If you have basically an interdigitated back contact uh, that's sitting at the top, like that other American slash French slash Philippine company I was, I was mentioning, that's a very high power density type of technology. It's also very expensive. Not everyone wants to pay a dollar per watt for their module. The PERT architecture is basically very similar to the passivated emitter rear cell technology found on P-type mono. So mono PERC implies a P-type mono. PERT, P-E-R-T, um, is not the brand of shampoo. It is uh, basically the N-type mono equivalent of the PERC. Again, this is relevant to manufacturing and how REC is systematically edging into this. We are very, very fluent with PERC processes. The PERT process, very similar, simply using an N-type mono wafer. This is our way of assuring reliability um, and, and performance in the field because we're not going to something that is so new and unfamiliar that there's going to be uh, significant challenges in, in getting it done and executed. Um, of course, as part of this, we have a split junction box. Um, a lot of design features that have been proven and out there in the field with the Twin Peaks series for quite a bit of time. Just imagine if a solar panel form factor, i.e. a 60 cell form factor, is sort of like the size of the car. You have different cell technologies you could put in. That's like having a different engine option. This is simply a more powerful engine option in, in the chassis and the framework of a module that we already know how to build quite well. What does this thing look like? There's the depiction on the right. We can talk about black back sheet in a sec. But ultimately, if someone is looking for a highly reliable, highly dependable, power dense, no LID, physically strong module at a excellent value price point, I don't think they're gonna find much that is very competitive with REC's NP. Now we can go back down into the, the weeds a little bit. And again, not trying to make this a, uh, a science demonstration or, or a science lecture, but it's important to understand between N-type and P-type, what is the fundamental difference? These are basically the two basic architectures of crystalline PV. In the world of semiconductors, you're gonna have to create a PN junction, a positive negative junction. This is what makes the photovoltaic effect work. You basically have adjacent material layers one of them inherently has more electrons than what it wants, and the other side has less. So already one side wants to give an electron to the other side. If you connect uh, electrical leads to that, if you make a circuit and you energize somehow the electrons, it will jump across the PN junction, it'll push the next little electron out of the way, and down a circuit, um, that's what creates the flow of direct current electricity. What we are using with the PV effect is photons from the sun. It's energy imparted literally from photons hitting these molecules is what causes this. There's two ways to build your solar cell. What we call the bulk layer in this picture, that's basically the wafer. Bulk meaning just the bulk of the material, the largest thickness. It's, it's the substrate that you're starting with. So imagine you have a, a bunch of silicon that's melted into an ingot, slicing into blocks, slicing your wafers from there, you're going to apply some chemical processes to your wafer to either inherently dope it positively or dope it negatively. Again, this is gonna determine whether it wants to give up inherently or take an electron. The majority of technology in the marketplace today that is cost effective and higher power density is monoperc. This is positively doped. This is typically using a boron to create that positive charge. The drawback there is that you can create this boron oxygen uh, impurity defect. This is basically the initial stabilization. This is the phenomenon of LID, light induced degradation, is majority caused by that boron oxygen impurity defects. In a N-type cell, 
you are literally using force. You're going uh, phosphorus. You're going the other way around. You're creating a negative charge. There is no boron. There is no such thing as a phosphorus oxygen impurity. So literally, you cannot technology-wise have light-induced degradation on a n-type cell. Very important initial thing to understand. Um, Regardless of the cell design in an n-type, we talked a little bit about PERT before, where you basically see a very similar layer on the backside of the cell to what's being done in a PERC p-type mono. But ultimately, the net effect of this design is that you have a very stable uh, efficiency of the product through time. You have a very good performance at higher temperatures. Um, that little line there where it says higher yields at higher wavelengths. I know it's confusing because wavelengths are either long or short, not high or low. That's some corporate wording that they should probably change. But higher wavelengths, what they mean is higher energy wavelengths, meaning shorter wavelengths, meaning higher frequencies. So basically at that end of the spectrum, great conversion efficiencies, great spectral response actually across the board. And there's some interesting possibilities on the n-type substrate to even go beyond that. We'll talk about that in a sec. But this is a technology that works extremely well. Um, numerous folks have had N-type product in the market for a number of years, for actually decades. Um, the challenge has been that no one has been able to make it cost effective. This is the major innovation right now, and this is what REC is doing to make this technology uh, accessible to the market. This next slide here is my attempt at showing the entire value chain upstream, downstream, basically from the building blocks that we are working with, again, REC being a vertically integrated company, we are literally refining silicon in our factory in Norway. So starting out with refined silicon going all the way to a constructed system, what is happening here? Reading left to right, so you're refining a silicon material. When you're refining it, it, it is not yet characterized as, uh, as mono or, or multi. So polycrystalline, multicrystalline being synonyms, monocrystalline being the opposite, exactly as it would imply, this is, a, this is an ingot characterization. So after you refine your silicon and get out the impurities, you're either going to try to draw a single crystal. Imagine a, uh, like those kids' crystal growing kits. You're growing a single crystal as large as you can with, with consistent grain structure, meaning there's no grain boundaries because it's all just one big crystal. Does that sound a little bit expensive? Yeah, it's more expensive. You can get some higher efficiencies. There's some other nice properties. Again, that's been the innovation in the industry the last few years is making monocrystalline more cost efficient. The other way to do this is you simply melt it all together and you have multiple crystals that are growing in different directions as you slice across this. If you imagine the, a multicrystalline cell, when you look and see sort of the different shapes within it, what you're seeing is a grain boundary. You're seeing the boundary between different crystals that are growing in different directions. So there's a little bit less ultimate uh, efficiency potential in that. It is not any less reliable, to be clear about that. It is a very mature and reliable technology, but you're gonna hit basically a certain limitation of power density that really we are all as manufacturers bumping up against. I mean, REC with a 290, 295 multi 60 cell, I don't think anyone can go much beyond there. You would basically create a very expensive product that's still not as high efficiency as mono, so why would you do that? So to some degree, it's not uh, obsolete. There is no functional obsolescence of multicrystalline. And maybe at some price point, it still lives in certain applications, but the overall power density and efficiency roadmap is really, really supercharged um, by, by monocrystalline designs. So that's why you see the prevalence of mono in the market. But again, this is about the optionality of, well, P-type versus N-type, it's all mono. What's the difference? Let's say it's a product that had the same exact uh, power class. Say, let's pick 320 just to match up with, with REC's NPEAK. There are literally several P-type offerings that are also 320s. What is the difference there? The difference is within the particular stage that they've uh, labeled in this diagram, doping. This is basically where you're applying treatments to your wafer. So circled in red, you're either going to dope it with that boron or the phosphorus that we mentioned in the previous slide. From there, you're going on to uh, the cell processing technologies, what they are calling wiring and coating. Could be on a P-type mono perk cell, as many as 13 or 14 individual process steps. Um, some of the actually very high efficiency N-type process steps, there's only six or seven. Um, the challenge in the past, again, has been that the equipment's been extremely expensive. Some of those designs were stuck on a five inch wafer so the uh, SunPower and, and Panasonic and the old Sanyo product, 
That's why they had uh, very high voltages and, and funny form factors because they're working with a five inch wafer where you have to stack up a bunch of them. Remember, current is related to the area of a cell. A five inch wafer is gonna have less of that. So it has inherently lower current, but high power means higher voltage in that product. Um, the future is all six inch cell. So that is our product. It is a N-type mono on a six inch cell. Um, from the, the cells, we are creating the interconnects, whether it's a, a half cut design or not to make a solar module. And then you guys are applying your engineering installation uh, proficiencies to build arrays of modules. So that is the entire solar value stream. There's a lot of ways to optimize your design for different characteristics. If purely power density is all you care about, and you will pay any price, like NASA, because they're spending billions of dollars on a space program anyway, my satellite only has a certain amount of area, I need as much energy as possible. Okay, then I will spend $100 a watt for the best possible technology that doesn't really play well in the distributed generation segment. Whether it's residential or commercial, you're talking about a need to be competitive, not just with the market, but with retail power, basically what a customer would do anyway. So REC is acutely aware of this. If you look at the diagram on the lower right-hand side, you will see an array of different technologies and basically their theoretical cell concept limitation. I mentioned before that a standard uh, P-type, you're gonna sort of run out of a headroom at a certain point. That's about the 19% cell efficiency range. You can bump up to a uh, P-type mono perk, get up to around 20% cell efficiency. The technology that's called B emitter, boron emitter, that's basically, the, that's a synonym for the PERT technology, P-E-R-T, that we're using on our N-type. Go to about 21% there. Beyond there, you're talking about getting a little more exotic. It's either the, so H-I-T was actually the Sanyo trademarked name. The industry knows that as H-J-T, heterojunction technology, meaning a N-type mono wafer, and then also using amorphous silicon for its passivation properties, and also can optimize across multiple band gaps, et cetera. Um, you're talking about historically some exotic, expensive stuff up in that range, but that is going to change. We'll talk a bit about that. But again, the key to commercialization is that bottom line on the left. Everything comes at a cost. We are not trying to make a gold-plated module that costs one, two dollars a watt. We're trying to progress the LCOE competitiveness of solar with our product. That is REC's focus. What we are seeing as our uh, horse for the future, again, it's, it's N-type because of these reasons. Um, the picture of the back of the frame illustrates a bit about the frame design that I had mentioned that gives us the ability, not just with the cell performance and cell reliability, but also the mechanical reliability of the product to extend a better warranty. Very clearly, we see the two support bars there. Again, if you imagine forces, whether it's snow pushing from the front side, whether it's wind pushing from the back side, a, a 60 cell module, I'm sure everyone on the phone has, has held one, it's fairly large. And basically the strength of a frame around the outside, you reach a certain point where you can't even make it stronger across the middle by making it increasingly thicker. So using more material in the frame on the outside only gets you so far. Really the next step, the next evolution of that is to put the support bars across the inside that you see clearly now from looking at them. Of course, that would prevent the laminate from flexing. It would prevent cracks and micro cracks and all those things that we don't want to happen to the cells in the life of the product. So again, this is something that is an REC design feature that was uh, originally released on our 72 cell module about four years ago. Very good feedback from the field. We are going to have to be a little careful about some rayless racking systems, talk about that in a minute, but overall a very elegant very interesting design. REC on the engineering side, I believe does a great job within our technical team in, in Munich um, on clearly defining what are the strength characteristics, what are the installation protocols for our modules. That's what is shown in this color-coded diagram. So the first thing to become acquainted with is what these different colors mean. Um, this particular one, because of the nuances of the uh, the design and where the support bars are, there are more colors than on some of our other products. At one point, there was only basically three colors, kind of red, yellow, green. Now you're seeing blue, green, gray, yellow, red, but it's all relevant, super easy to read. If you just basically look at the permitted test loads, that's top down, 
your blue is going to be where it's the strongest, meaning either where you are grabbing the module from the, the underside by using the mounting holes or a clamp from the top. Um, this is typically going to be on a, a rail-based type of uh, racking system. The blue areas are going to be where you are the strongest. That's the most traditional locations. Still quite strong as you go out to the green, decently strong as you get to the yellow. The red is where we really do not want to clamp it. So again, these are areas that are towards the, the very center. That would be a, a pretty strange application. But these are things to be aware of that as you optimize these designs, you end up with very, very good results within the design parameters um, and, and maybe not as good when you go out of that. So this is all in our installation manual. These are all downloads available at recgroup.com, um, also available from your local AE representative. So cable-wise, connector-wise, these are all things that are going to be uh, within the expectations. We're using MC4 original connectors from multi-contact, which is owned by Stobley. Very, very interesting product, very compelling product, still has these partial shaded advantages. This is just a visual depiction of what I alluded to before, which is that the traditional solar panel with 60 cells that are interconnected all in series would have bypass diode protection across the long side, meaning the tall side of the module, you start to get shading on that side. These things, basically every row of two has its own bypass diode. So you would knock out the production of the first two rows with some long side shading, but two thirds of the module would produce just fine. You could go all the way and shade two thirds of it and one third of it would be fine, engaging two bypass diodes. But the nasty little secret is that you start to shade across of the short side. And in residential, this happens all the time because there are trees, there's different roof pitches, there's chimneys, there's roof, there's all sorts of things. So you get some shading across the short side, even from maybe soiling, and you can knock out the production of that entire module pretty quickly. This is one of the exciting ancillary benefits of a half cut module design is that literally we can short side shade half of the module and the other half will produce just fine. So a nice real world benefit, again, we are not trying to win the internet with the highest possible power rating. We are trying to create products that produce the best possible energy yield in kilowatt hours for many, many, many years in the field. Part of that has been backed up again as a prudent conservative company. We don't play the numbers game just in matching warranties. Hey, X, Y, or Z did this. We're just gonna match the same thing and uh, hope it works out. We do a tremendous amount of internal testing. We do extended chamber testing. We do uh, keep track of units that have been deployed in the field. So we have a great degree of confidence around what we are warranting. So the fact that a prudent conservative company like REC has gone to such an aggressive warranty this year, that means a lot. We're very excited to have that. This slide here, we're uh, sort of edging up on, on the end. There's gonna be a few important points. So I hope you all are still paying attention. But this is one of the more interesting comparisons. This is something that numerous customers have asked us to do in the last few months, specific to one competitor's product, which I will leave nameless at this point in time. But basically, it is a highly reputable uh, Korean company that is also now producing half-cut cell modules. You look at theirs versus ours optically from the front and the power cost and everything, it looks like a clone. I mean, literally, if you tried to build an exact copy, it couldn't look more similar. However, the devil is always in the details. And when talking about the technical superiority of the N-type cell, this is where it shows through because these two products come in the same STC power class. You can buy a 320 of ours, you can buy a 320 of theirs. There's a lot of elements that are gonna be almost the same. Is it dimensionally about the same? Yes, it is. Does it weigh about the same? Yes, it is. Are they both half cut cell architecture? Yes, they are. Has REC been doing half-cut cells longer than these other folks? Yes, we have. But as we go into the objective side, that matters. This is the area that's highlighted in green. Are we gonna have a better power output guarantee in the warranty? Yes, are we gonna have a longer product warranty? Yes, we are. Are we gonna have the ability to secure higher snow loads? Yes, we are. Are we going to be resistant to LID in a way that they are not? Yes, we are. Are we gonna have a higher overall module efficiency? A little bit better temperature coefficients? Yes, lower NOCT. If you look at the third party validation within the PVUSA test conditions with the CEC rating, you simply do the math of the PTC rating divided by the STC watt class. That is a higher percentage for REC, meaning more likely to perform well in real world conditions. 
even more exciting is the last bullet point. So there's a white paper we have based off of approximately nine months of testing. Um, I mentioned last year when we first started making this product, it was new to REC. We didn't have a ton of actual real world data on how this thing would, would, would act. And what we did is we deployed uh, a couple of our units against a comparative unit in the field in Singapore. This was a research body called the Solar Energy Research Institute of Singapore associated with the National University of Singapore. This is not an REC test bed. This is literally an academic facility. And measuring energy yield for energy yield, our product versus this competitor's product, literally there was 8% better energy yield in kilowatt hours. That is a huge number. And I would be the first to say, no, we shouldn't all run around and set expectations with our customers. They'll get 8% more energy out of an REC product. Typically, REC has been known for this. One, two, 3%, yes, we see that quite often. 8% pretty aggressive. It speaks to two things. One is REC's focus on real-world performance and reliability. The other is the inherent superiority of the N-type platform. That is creating this better energy yield, the same as, say, Sanyo used to uh, used to rely on back in the day about their their HIT product, which was tremendous. It was very expensive, but it produced a heck of a lot of energy. And there's uh, a lot of good science behind there, and a lot of things to take into the future, which we'll talk about in just a sec. One thing I do want to call out is that there is this fixation on all black product and residential. Um, I get it. I uh, personally don't think it looks as good when it gets dirty, but uh, in any case, none of us will be able to tell our customers who are fixated on, on all black that they shouldn't have it. So a high-end residential product, in our opinion, does need to be all black. There is one fundamental difference in our new all black version of NPEAK. The first units are literally arriving on our shores end of March, beginning of April. That's right around the corner. That's right within the business cycle time. That means we can all go sell projects with this product right now, order it through AEE and then have it delivered to us. It does drop your power density a little bit. Instead of a 320, you're gonna get a 315. That will also march up through, through the year. But I wanna call out one interesting aspect, which is in that picture on the lower left, I've, I have a big no diagram with some arrows. That's actually a prior REC product. That is the all black multi-crystalline product that we called Twin Peak 2 Black 2. This was actually a multi-cell with a reactive ion etch to give it that black look on a black back sheet. But what were still visible were the three what we call cross connectors. If you look where the arrows are pointing to on every single module, there is a top, middle, and bottom cross connector. It's part of the module level busing that allows current to flow around the module. Very typical for a half-cut cell product to have that middle one. Again, you have two parallel halves. Our competitors' products also have that. On a white back sheet, the aesthetics are not so noticeable. On a black back sheet, it really looks like it bisects the module. You're looking at a bunch of black stuff with three big silver bars. The main competitors' product that has something that looks like this, they have silver cross connectors. Go look at a picture of it. On ours, we're going to be covering that. Does it cost more money for us? Yes. Does it reduce the units per hour of production? Yes. Those are painful things from a manufacturing perspective, but in our minds, it is aesthetically the right answer, and the aesthetics are the only reason you go all black. So yes, cover those things up. That's what the product will look like on the right-hand side. It is deliberately all black. You'll see maybe just tiny bus bars or the, the bars that are on the cell, but none of those cross connectors that provide that sort of you know, blocky aesthetic that you see on the lower left. So very excited about that. I think that's something that will uh, sell out quite quickly. So please do move quickly. If, if you have a customer base that's interested in all black, the first production volumes to the US will be about five megawatts. Um, if those are sold quickly, then we'll go ahead and, and plan on batch producing some more. Where do we go from there? Is the current NPEAK product tremendous and a tremendous value? Absolutely. But this is just the beginning for REC. Again, REC is looking to carve out a niche, a new market position, being the experts in cost-effective, high-performance N-type mono. The current NPEAK, which you recall, is the PERT, P-E-R-T, cell architecture. We can go higher than that in power density. It wasn't a smart thing to do right away. Again, we need to develop our competency so that you know that you're getting a highly reliable product. But where we are going by the end of this year, 
literally the cell production equipment has already been ordered, is in process of being shipped from Europe to our factory in Singapore. Um, it takes, of course, numerous months to actually get those cell lines set up, get everything fully debottlenecked. It's going to go into a very similar module design to what you're seeing with XPeak. Oh, I'm sorry, with NPeak. But the new XPeak will, again, I talked about the optionality of sort of like a car having a more powerful engine choice. There's going to be a more powerful engine choice sitting within this XPeak that's going to go up to about 370 watts on a traditional 60 cell form factor. It's going to have even better energy yield and even better temperature coefficients than what we're seeing with today's NPeak, which is already better than the competition. REC is starting to tease out a little bit of information. We are exhibiting this thing at shows in Japan and Europe, and of course, it'll be in the US towards the end of the year. Um, the first deliverable volumes will be at the very end of this year. But a very simplified cell diagram of this technology is on the lower right. This is not exactly what ours will look like because we're going to what's called a smart wire technology for the busing on the top. There won't be traditional bus bars. It'll be more like the uh, sort of thin strings on a guitar um, that, that are, are very difficult to see. But the essential element of how this is built, this is the same N-type wafer that we've been talking about this entire presentation. But in this case, we are creating our PN junctions in some passivation with amorphous silicon layers. This is very similar to the technology that Sanyo and Panasonic uh, used to deploy. Again, their trade name, trademarked, was HIT, heterointrinsic thin layer, but the industry generally knows this as HJT, heterojunction technology, multiple junction. This is going back to the efficiency chart. On that lower right, look at the very top. The highest crystalline cell efficiencies you can get with HIT technology or using interdigitated back contact. The problem with IBC is right now there's no cost-effective means to manufacture that. So you end up with a sun power type of price point, if you will, for lack of a, a better description. But with a traditional front contacted, um, optimizing the latest variation of that, which are these smart wires instead of full bus bars, you have a very powerful product, very high energy yield, very power dense, very reliable, very good temperature coefficients. It's basically the next level up from what we're already doing with NPeak, which is already great. So a lot to look forward to. Very, very excited about that. This is a product that you will have access to through AEE, and more information will be coming through the year. So before we jump into the Q&A, let me just show a couple slides because I know that I have raised a few eyebrows with my statement about the energy yield. And you can't just go around tossing around numbers like 8% greater weigh weight. Let's, let's look and dissect that. What is going on here? Who did this? Is it valid? Is it credible? Here is a chart that shows clearly what the testing results were. Again, that icon in the top right, that's the Solar Energy Research Institute of Singapore. We gave our modules to them. They ran the whole test. We didn't touch it. We actually took one of our older generation products, that is the sort of maroon looking triangle, that was the Twin Peak 2 uh, 290 watt multi-crystalline. We had two of our N-Peak units, which is the blue circle and the red square. And we also have the quote unquote equivalent competitor module. So um, again, this is the competitor's module that I mentioned in a previous slide that optically looks very similar. This is a Korean company with a P-type mono half-cut cell architecture. They can hit the same power densities, maybe even higher than us in STC. But what kind of energy yield are these things putting out? The REC products clearly head and shoulders above, especially the N-type. If you look at the aggregate, this is simply the, the trending day by day through the month over that nine-month period. But if you look at the average between both of the N-peak units and the competitor module, that's literally an 8% difference. It's a heck of a lot of, of, of kilowatt hours. Is that impressive? Yes. Is it surprising? Not altogether. Would it be exactly that in all climates and all insulation areas? Probably not. But the point is that this is a very, very powerful technology, something that if the consumer understands beyond just a data sheet, which looks about the same, and the optics of looking at this thing looks about the same, that power class number looks about the same. What are they getting? Getting something that is more resistant to degradation um, of, of all methodologies, whether it's mechanical or LID, 
and extremely high energy yield that can be relied upon for years to come. This is a important conversation to have because this will be an even bigger difference as we launch into the next generation of product, which is that XP. So with that being said, I'll go ahead and rewind here to the, the thank you slide. Um, for those of you that are running short on time, um, thank you for spending time with us. This uh, slide deck will be distributed through AE and available to you. Um, but Caitlin, why don't we go 